Well, I do want to say before we dive in this morning, uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in here. And I want you to know that if you are a biological mother, an adoptive mother, a foster mother, a mother-to-be or a mother who hasn't gotten to hold her babies this side of heaven, I want you to know that you are loved and you are valued here at Gilead Baptist Church. And we celebrate you today. And so would you just show your appreciation for the mothers in this room, please? And I am so happy that you were here this morning, and I'm happy that all of you are here today as we get to study God's Word together. And speaking of that, would you grab your Bibles and meet with me in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. Last week we saw the interlude between the sixth and the seventh seal. We saw the one who we are to desire more, but now the seventh seal is about to be opened. And from the seventh seal come the seven trumpets. And to an outside world who does not understand what is going on, they might think when these trumpets come that things cannot get any worse. But they will. And this morning we see that even in the midst of this doom and gloom, there is an invitation of grace. The grace of God is evident even in the midst of judgment. And so we're going to see this beginning in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to ask if you would, please, out of reverence for God's word, would you stand with me as we read this morning? Scripture says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. The angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. So a third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain ablaze with fire was hurled into the sea, so a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from heaven. It fell on a third of the rivers and springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, so many of the people died from the waters because they had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. I looked and heard an eagle flying high overhead, crying out in a loud voice, Woe, 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 to those who live on the earth because the remaining trumpet blast that the three angels are about to sound. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, so often we avoid the doom and gloom, as we call it. We like to talk about your love, but when we talk about wrath and judgment, we shy away. But help us this morning to see that even in the midst of what we would call doom and gloom, there is an invitation of grace. And that you invite lost sinners, even in the midst of this, to come to you. And so open our eyes and open our hearts this morning, not to ignore the invitation in this passage, but for us to come running towards your grace. Lord, we pray that you speak, for we are listening. And church, if you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. On December 18th in 1998, one of the greatest animated musicals of all time hit the big screen for the first time. The Prince of Egypt was without a doubt one of the greatest animated movies of all time. The music is unparalleled, the voice acting is powerful, and of course the story is great. Because DreamWorks adapted the story of Exodus. Adapted the story in particular of Moses' life from his birth all the way to where he led uh, Israel out of Egypt. Now the movie is great, but they kind of own at the beginning that they're going to take some artistic license with the movie. They're going to add some things, they're going to take away some things, just for the purpose of communicating their story. 
But despite all of that, I'd recommend that movie to anybody. It is fantastic. It is powerful. But I do have one issue with the movie. And it's kind of ironic because my one issue with the movie comes from my favorite song in the movie. See, the story goes that when Moses returns back to Egypt, he sees his brother Ramses. And they are excited to see one another. They kind of rekindle a little bit. His brother just expects Moses to take his place again, that he'll pardon the murder Moses committed, and everything will be good. But Moses tells his brother the Pharaoh that he has not come to reconcile. He has come to demand that Pharaoh let the people of Israel go. Well, he refuses. So far, so good. But then it goes to the Nile. Moses again sees his brother on the Nile and says, Ramses, let my people go. And when he refuses, Moses turns the water in the Nile to blood. But Ramses thinks it's just a magic trick, disregards it, and does not let the people go. And this is where my issue comes in. Because immediately after this scene, the song The Plagues begins. And it's a good song. It's a great song. Didn't know Val Kilmer could sing, but he can And in this song, it seems as though God pours out eight of the ten plagues on Egypt because of Pharaoh's rejection at the Nile. They happen in quick succession. They happen because of what he rejected when the Nile turned to blood. And while there is a powerful moment in that story, the story of Exodus actually is heavier and more tragic. See, eight of the plagues were not poured out on Egypt because Pharaoh rejected at the Nile, but because Pharaoh kept rejecting the Lord. After every plague, Pharaoh was given an invitation to repent, to change his mind, which would lead to a change of heart, which would result in Egypt going in a change of direction. It was a call for Pharaoh to repent of his pride and to let the people go. But after every plague, Pharaoh refused. He refused to repent until it was too late. Plague after plague, refusal after refusal. He kept delaying repentance. He kept delaying letting the people go until the tenth plague came. And Pharaoh's own son was killed. Then and only then, when Egypt was devastated, when Egypt lost all the firstborn children, only then did Pharaoh relent. Only then did he let the people go, but it was too late. The damage had been done. Judgment had been poured out. And you might wonder, what does the ten plagues have to do? What does this story in Exodus have to do with Revelation chapter 8? Well, it's this very background of what happened in Exodus that shows us what's happening with the trumpet judgment. See, these trumpets remind us of the plagues. They are connected, but compared to the trumpets, the plagues are tame. Compared to these trumpet judgments, the plagues can't hold a candle to them. These trumpets... Judgments are resounding, a resounding declaration of war from God to his enemies. And so here he will pour out his judgment on them. He will pour out judgment through these trumpet judgments, mimicking the plagues, seeing the similarities between them. And so you might wonder, okay, well, if the plagues are the background for the trumpets, then where does Pharaoh's refusal to repent come in? Where does Pharaoh's hardness of heart come in? Well, it comes in by showing us in the same way Pharaoh delayed repentance until it was too late. We often delay repentance until it is too late. You see, the invitation of grace will end. The invitation to come and give your life to the Lord is not eternal. There is a day where it stops. There is a day where the music no longer plays. And when these trumpet judgments come, it is a warning from God that there is still a little time. But it's running out. There is still time to repent, but it is coming to an end. And so you and I as believers, we have to look at our own lives and say, do we need to repent, not delay repenting? I mean, how often do we delay our repentance? How often do we delay by holding on to our bitterness? How long do we delay by holding on to those sins we kind of keep in the dark we don't want people to know about? And how often do we delay repentance by not thinking our sin's that big of a deal? When God says it is, and he's saying, while there is time, come. And to those who are not saved, the Lord says, come while there's time. Because you and I need to repent today while grace is still extended. Because these trumpet judgments show us that will not always be the case. 
And repentance is not this burden that God wants to put on us that is heavy and weighty and that we cannot bear, but rather repentance is an invitation to see God's grace more clearly. Repentance is the way by which we have insight into God's grace and we see just what his grace shows us. And Revelation 8 shows us this. Revelation 8 reveals this invitation of grace from God to his enemies and how we can experience his grace. And so we need to repent because God's grace shows us his faithfulness. We need to repent because God's grace shows us his faithfulness. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. After the sixth seal, after the interlude, he opens the seventh seal and there is silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now that's significant. We shouldn't just kind of glance over that. Because what's been happening in heaven up until this point? Praise. Praise after praise to the one on the throne, to the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb who washes the nations clean with his blood. There has been nonstop praise in heaven from the moment we saw this revelation from John. But now in chapter 8, there is silence. There's no praise, there's no chorus, there is deafening silence in heaven. And why is that? Well, there are many theories, people debate what this means, but all we need to know is simply this. Just because it is silent in heaven does not mean God is not working. Just because God is silent does not mean he does not hear our prayers, respond to our prayers, and he's not working in the midst of our pain. God's silence is not his rejection. Look what's happening even in the midst of this silence. It's silent in heaven, and then seven angels who stand in the presence of God, seven trumpets were given to them. Even though it's silent, God is still working. Even though it is silent in heaven before the trumpet blast, God is still moving. And so often we feel that silence of God in our lives, do we not? We pray, and we don't feel like God's listening. We pray, and we don't feel like God's answering. We pray, and we wonder if God even cares, and we feel he's at his distance. We can't, we can't feel him right now. We can't hear him right now. We're not experiencing right, him right now. And we think because we can't hear, feel, or experience the Lord, that must mean he's not working. It must mean he's rejected us. And it must mean that he's done with us. But the silence of God does not prove that. The silence of God actually proves that he's working even when you can't hear him. That he's working even when you don't feel him. That he's working even when you cannot experience him. God is always working. God is always moving. At any point in our lives, we might know of one or two things God is doing in our lives. We don't know the countless thousands of other things God is doing in our lives at that very moment. Just because God is silent does not mean God is ignoring you or that he doesn't love you or that he's not moving or working. Even in the midst of this silence, God is moving. And what God is doing here in the silence, he is hearing and answering the prayers of his people. Look at verse 3. Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar, and he was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. Now remember, we're in the book of Revelation, which means there's a lot of symbolism, a lot of imagery going on here. So what's going on? How would a first century reader understand what John had just written down? When they hear about the golden incense burner, they hear about the smoke coming up, they're thinking about Leviticus 16. When the cloud arose, when the cloud descended on the temple after the sacrifice, it showed that it was divinely accepted by God. So in conjunction with the prayers that we see here, what does this mean? It means that the prayers of the saints are accepted, heard, and answered by God. It means that your prayers do not go on empty ears. It means that God hears your prayer. It means that God responds to your prayer. It may not be the answer you want. That God's kind of in the business of not giving us the answer we want, but the answer we need. It may not be the answer you want, but God does respond and he hears the prayers of his people. They are accepted by him. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. God hears and accepts the prayers of his people, which shows us what's really going on with these trumpet judgments. These trumpet judgments are the answer to the question posed by those who have been slaughtered, by those who were revealed in the fifth seal, those who cried out, How long, O God? How long, oh God, must this continue going on? How long, oh God, must we suffer? How long must we feel pain? How long must the world seem as though it's going to win? How long, God? And the trumpet judgments are God's answer saying, no longer. No more. 
The world does not win. Pain does not have the final word. When the trumpets are blown, God declares war on his enemies, and it's coming to an end. The prayers of the saints are what leads to these trumpet judgments. Look what happens in verse 5. The angel takes the incense burner, fills with the fire from the altar, and he hurls it at the earth. Signifying this, God is answering his people's prayers. But when we think about answered prayer, we don't often think about judgment being an answer. We don't think about wrath being an answer. When we pray, we expect the answer to be grace or mercy or love or kindness. And yes, God is all of those things. But listen to me. If we don't talk about the wrath, the holiness, or the righteousness of God, words like grace, mercy, and love mean nothing. But because God is righteous, because he is holy, he answers the prayers of those who have been slaughtered, those the world has beat down. He answers those prayers with judgment coming on the earth. Because he is faithful to his people. He never abandons his people on their worst day. He never ignores them. He never rejects them. He is continually faithful to them. But we often don't see that. We don't often see the faithfulness of God when life is hard. We don't see the faithfulness of God when we feel like our prayers aren't being answered in the way we want them to be answered. But when we start thinking we know better than God, You know what that means? That God extends an invitation for us to repent. To acknowledge that he is God and we are not. And when we repent and we give ourselves over to God's grace, guess what we get to see? His faithfulness. We get to see how he works, even if it's not the way we want him to. We get to see how his ways are better. And what we see here in verses 1 through 5 in these trumpet judgments is God showing my silence does not mean I am not listening. And in the midst of the silence, I am working and I am bringing together all things according to my good and perfect will for the good of my people. Because he is a faithful, loving, righteous, and holy God. And those who know him We often fall into that trap of thinking we know better than him. But God still extends the invitation for us to repent and to see that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He invites us to see this through repentance, through removing this burden of thinking we know better and giving into the rest and the peace that he gives, trusting his good and perfect will. So if you need to repent this morning, Turn away from your pride. Turn away from thinking you know better. Turn away from being the person who thinks they can give God advice. And see that he is better. And that he is always faithful. And if you're in here and you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, you can come and experience God's faithfulness today. His faithfulness to his word that all who call upon his name will be saved. But you have to repent. And you have to believe. The invitation is for you to repent and to experience God's grace and to repent so that you can see his faithfulness. And the good news is when you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, when you repent and believe, you are also shielded from God's judgment. Repent because God's grace shields us from judgment. Here in verse 6, we have the seven trumpets. Things are about to go from bad to worse very quickly. See, the seven seals that we saw, that was revealing to us man's own depravity, how through our own depravity we've we've enacted judgment even on ourselves. But now, this is not man's own self-inflicted judgment. This is God's judgment. This is his declaration of war. Because you know what trumpets represent throughout the Bible? Trumpets represent a declaration of war and the inauguration of a new king. And so when these trumpets are blown, it is saying God is declaring war on his enemies. He is declaring war on those who have rebelled. He is declaring war on those who have not repented and believed. War is coming. And we see this with these four, first four trumpets. In the first trumpet, the first angel blew his trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. Now what does that sound like? Remember, Exodus is the best commentary on Revelation. Does that not sound like one of the plagues? Hail coming upon the earth? Well, here it is again, but this time magnified. Hail and fire mixed with blood hurled to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So in the seals, what did we see? A fourth. Now we see a third. Escalation. 
things are getting worse. Judgment's being poured out. The second trumpet is blown, and something like a great mountain ablaze with fire was hurled into the sea, so a third of the sea became blood. Does that sound familiar? Turning the Nile to blood? Here it is, but magnified. A third of the seas turned to blood because of a great mountain ablaze with fire. Now, I take this to mean this, a volcanic eruption, the likes of which we have never seen. Something so cataclysmic, something so abrupt and sudden and devastating that we can't even wrap our heads around it. Because after all, when God moves against his enemies, you know what happens? All of creation is undone. We saw this with the peals of thunder, the flashes of lightning, and the earthquakes. And now nature itself is feeling the judgment of God and is pouring out judgment on all creation. So a third of living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. But we're not done yet. The third trumpet is blown. And a great star blazing like a torch fell from heaven. It's a meteorite. It fell on a third of the rivers and springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the many waters became Wormwood. Now, what's so significant about Wormwood? Well, in this time, in this culture, Wormwood was actually used in medicine, but it made the medicine very bitter. So here, what does the Wormwood meteorite do? It makes the waters bitter. And many people died from the waters. Because they had been made bitter. The third trumpet brings about the first human casualties. But notice, the trumpets aren't yet targeted towards humans. Just to creation. Things are escalating. Judgment is being poured out and the fourth trumpet is blown. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, and a third of them were darkened. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. Now, why is this so significant? Well, number one, it should remind us of the plague of darkness that came over Egypt. When Egypt was covered with darkness, they could not see their hand that was in front of them. And what does this darkness mean? Remember, darkness is not just something we read and go, okay, yeah, it's very dark, but it rep represents a spiritual state. Darkness means being cut off from the living God. 1 John 1, uh, verse 5 says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. None whatsoever. So to be in darkness is to be cut off from the God who is light. From the God who is love. From the God who gives life. It's dark. And all of these trumpets are not just new judgments God came up with, but the prophet Joel prophesied about them when he said in Joel 2, verses 30 through 32, I will display it wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised, among the survivors the Lord calls. The Lord did not just wake up one day and decide trumpet judgments sound great. He's been telling us for thousands of years about these judgments. There have been warnings throughout the scriptures that when this terrible day of the Lord comes, judgment is poured out. God is waging war on his enemies. His kingdom is coming to be established on this earth. But notice, how did Joel end his prophecy? All those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Because even in the midst of extreme judgment, there is salvation. Even in the midst of what we call doom and gloom, there is grace. You might wonder, well, where is the grace in the trumpet judgments? Well, let's think about this for a moment. If trumpets are a declaration of war and the inauguration of a kingdom, then why is there still restraint? Why is it not total devastation? Why is it not total destruction? Because God is still giving his enemies a chance to repent. To be shielded from what's to come. Because when the next three trumpets are blown, and when the seven bowls are poured out, the invitation is done. 
But even in the midst of this judgment, what is God doing? He is, say, he is saying, come. Come to me. Come and be saved. Come and be shielded by the blood of Christ from what is to come. Come and repent and believe. Come and be made new. Come and repent today. These trumpet judgments show us that, yes, God wages war against his enemies, but even in his judgment, God is crying, come and repent, come and believe, come and be made set free, come and be shielded from what's to come, because God is a gracious God, and because he is holy and he is righteous, his grace means something. And it implores us to no longer delay, to no longer refuse, but to come today. There's an urgency to the book of Revelation. There is an urgency to salvation. There is an urgency to this invitation from God because this grace will not always be extended. And we need to repent because God's grace will stop being offered. It will stop being offered. Look at verse 13. I looked and heard an eagle representing an angel who is bringing swift words of judgment, flying high overhead, crying out in a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Because what is to come is so much worse than what has come already. And this shows us that one day grace will stop being offered. The invitation will come to an end. And that's why God says come today. Throughout scripture, you see today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Throughout the scripture, there's an urgency to it because this will not be offered forever. Grace will not be extended for all of eternity. There is a definite end to the invitation that God extends to his enemies, to those who rebel. And he says, come today while you can. Because you won't be able to eventually. And on that day when you cry out, well, Lord, I didn't know. Lord, I had no idea. That won't cut it. Because you do know. And the Lord has been calling you your whole life. Come and repent. Come and be washed by the blood of the Lamb. Come, and if you're a believer... The invitation for you is the same because we, in, a, in the moment we give our lives to Christ and we are born again, we are in a posture of repentance and faith. But we hold that posture for the rest of our lives, continually repenting of sin, continually repenting of what hinders our fellowship with God. Because if we give in to our sin, we delay repentance as believers. If we can't endure right now in this life, what's going to happen when things get worse? What's going to happen when judgment is poured out on the earth and God shields us from his judgment, but we're not spared from what the world might do? What happens on that day? If we keep delaying our repentance, we know the Lord's calling us, we know we have a sin in our lives, we know there's something going on. He says, repent of your bitterness, repent of your pride, repent of your anger, repent of your lust, and where he's calling us to repent today, but we keep saying, no, I have time. I'll live my life now, I'll do what I want, and I'll give you the rest of whatever's left after I've had my fun. It doesn't work that way. You don't have the time that you think you do. See, so often we are so arrogant thinking we are owed the next breath that we take. It's evident in the way we talk. When there's a tragedy, how do we often speak? When someone passes away suddenly, what do we often say? They were just taken too soon. They were taken before their time. And that's because we arrogantly think we are owed the next breath we take. And we are owed nothing from a righteous and holy God. But this righteous and holy God extends grace. And he says, come while you have breath in your lungs. Come and deal with your sin today. Come and be made new, made new by Jesus. The one who died on the cross for your sin and rose again to make you new. Come and know him. 
This is an invitation for all who were lost to come and to be saved. It's an invitation for us who believe, who are secure in the blood of Christ, to not delay repenting of sin that hinders our fellowship, but to repent today so we can experience the grace of God. We can see the grace of God. We can grow in the grace of God. But that will not happen if we delay repentance because we're not ready or because we don't feel like it's that big of a deal. Because so often I feel like what we do is this. We view repentance and we think, well, you only need to repent when you do something really bad. Like you have an affair on your spouse. You kill a guy. You steal a lot of money. That's when you repent. But as believers, there is so much more to war to repent of. And it's not always the egregious sins. Often it's the way we handle things. It's our short temper. It's our bitterness. It's our lack of forgiveness. And the Lord's calling you to deal with that today. This past week, if I'm being honest with you, was a rough week for me. It was a rough week because about a week ago, I made the mistake of calling Jonathan Chip. And if you don't know, Chip's the child we lost last year. So all that wound got brought up again this week, and it was just hard to deal with. I don't like grief. I don't, I don't like dealing with it. I don't think anyone does. But I wasn't handling it well, and I got home Wednesday night, and I was just, I was pretty much done. I was just done. I was burned out, I was tired, I was done. I woke up Thursday and I still felt that way. And, you know, so often when people feel that way, you know what we tell them? Well, go read your Bible more and go pray. I was doing all those things. I was trying to spend time with the Lord at night. But so often that time of sitting in silence turned into trying to catch up on my Bible reading plan. Because even pastors miss a day or two from time to time. But I was miserable, and I married someone who was a way better Christian than me, and so she encouraged me to actually go spend time with the Lord. She said, you, you need to go take care of this. And so I did. I went downstairs, and what I typically do when I spend time with the Lord at night is I just try to get silent. I recite Psalm 4610 to myself, try to get quiet, try to tune my ear to the voice of God when he brings up his word in my heart, or maybe I get an answer for something going on. And so what I did was I just took my Bible, I took a pen, a journal, a jug of water, and said, I'm not leaving until I hear something. It's called stubbornness. And I went downstairs and started off like I normally do. And then about five to ten minutes after I had some difficulty getting my mind quiet, I just breathed the question. I said, Holy Spirit, show me how I've been grieving you. Because by the way, he'll answer that question every time. And it is not fun. But it started off pretty typical. Well, you didn't, you know, redeem your time that well. Or, you know, maybe you didn't wake up early enough to read the Bible like you should have. Or maybe you could have spent a little more time in sermon prep. It was all typical stuff until this came up. How long are you going to be bitter and angry towards people who mean well but don't realize how insensitive their words often are? Well, in that moment, I was like, okay, something's happening. Something's getting dug up. I kept praying. I kept praying. I kept seeking. And then finally, clear as day in my heart, all I could think of was this. How long are you going to delay repenting for not giving your grief Now that broke me. I was like, Lord, what do you mean? I, I don't know how to give my grief to you. I don't know how to repent of this. I don't know what this looks like. And all I could feel in my heart was, stretch out your arms. And when you feel the Lord speaking to you, you, you kind of do what he says. So I did. And in that moment, it felt like the most secure and the safest and the most comforting hug I have ever been given. And then he said, go read Romans 8. And I did. Got to Romans 8, 15, and I stopped. For you have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the next thing I know, this is all I can hear. I'm your Abba, and I can take it but you have to give it to me. So not knowing what else to do, that's exactly what I did. Didn't know what else to do. Cried out to the Lord, gave it to him, and y'all felt joy and peace and comfort that I haven't felt in a year. 
I went to bed that night and fell asleep with no issues because I finally was at peace in my own heart. Now, the grief's still there. still hurts. But so often we try to deal with grief on our own, with pain on our own, with struggles on our own. And there is so much of our life that we tried to deal with on our own. We prioritize how we handle things or what we think about things. And we think that's okay. That's just who I am. The Lord's like, no, you are putting a burden on yourself. You cannot bear. You are going down a path you do not want to walk down. And you are hurting far more than you want to admit. But if you give it to me, if you give it to me, I can deal with it. I can take it. And many of us this morning need to listen to that invitation from God and give it to him. That's what repentance is. It's not a burden. It's the removal of a burden. It is the pathway to see God more clearly and to worship him and to love him. And he's not calling you to add a burden to yourself. Yes, repentance is hard, but it's only hard for a moment. And then there is peace, and then there is security, and then there is comfort, and then there is love from the God who loves you and who calls you to repent. And right now we have time. We may not have much more of it. And while we have it, we need to repent whether it's an egregious sin whether it's a hidden sin whether it's the way you've handled a situation maybe it's the way you haven't taken things to the Lord like he's called you to whatever it is he's calling you this morning to give it to him because he's your Abba and he can take it but you have to come and stop delaying. Would you bow your heads with me this morning?